This episode is sponsored by United Refrigeration and Westermeyer Industries, revolutionizing your HVACR experience. Visit URI.com for all your HVACR needs, offering real-time inventory, personalized pricing, and a nearby stock feature. Access quick pick replacement parts and branch details effortlessly. With 350 plus fully stocked locations across North America, our knowledgeable staff are ready to assist with the solutions you need. Exclusive offer, use code ARPOD on URI.com to get a $10 gift card when purchasing the Westermeyer oil float, part number W4300-38F. These high performance floats are not just compatible with their own oil separators, but also available as a crossover model conveniently stocked at United Refrigeration. That's code A-R-P-O-D to claim your $10 gift card. Visit URI.com now. The Sporland Division of Parker Hannifin Corporation is sponsoring this podcast. Sporland is the leading manufacturer of HVAC and R components. Using quality materials and craftsmanship, Sporland maintains a commitment to innovation, manufacturing excellence, service, and support for its customers since 1934. The company is known for its catch-all filter dryers, thermostatic expansion valves, solenoid valves, pressure regulating valves, suction filters, electric valves, controllers, supermarket monitoring solutions, chemicals, smart service tools, ZoomLock Max Press to Connect, and ZoomLock Push, Push to Connect, refrigerant fittings. If folks want to learn more, what do they do? Uh, you can go to Sporland.com. I guess that's Jim and John for Sporland signing off. temp compressors so these are three bitsers on one of our three by two racks because we get three bitsers here and if we open up the cabinet on the other side there's going to be two scrolls mm -hmm. basically we have a creon oil fill control module on top of that you can't see it right now but we have a slide later where you'll see the high pressure trip valve and then what i like to call are the brown prince relief valves on the front So if they go off and you're standing in front of it, it's not going to hurt you. You might get sprayed with a little oil, but that sudden release in a halo back towards the compressor will give you a thought. That you need to go to Walmart and pick up a new pair of underpants. At that point. So I have a question. So we were also talking about this. They're like, because those valves are actually set. And it's funny because you actually, if you look at the P&ID diagrams, they don't actually show them because I guess it's technically part of the compressor. But like in my research, I did it showed that there were like 2188 is when they pop off. And so they were asking me like what there was actually for. And I was like, I guess if you would wouldn't if you would valve off a compressor and you would forget to, you know, shut off the control circuit, which technically should kill the crankcase heater, if that thing would heat up, you still have CO2 in there. It's gonna rise up to whatever the crank crankcase saturated would be, depending on how high that temperature would get, and then basically pop the relief. I know also when sometimes when you get a crap load of, let's just say your oil separator isn't working because something blew out and then you get a whole bunch of, of oil back. That also is another reason why sometimes those reliefs will pop. Well, you'll get a crap load of oil and then all of a sudden it's trying to compress oil and but or if a, if one of the oil level controls as well, doesn't fully seat where it's just letting oil in because it's not seated. That's another reason what I've heard that these things could pop and the theory makes sense. That's probably one of our biggest you get trashing up up underneath that oil solenoid or a couple of the suppliers were a supplier was having issues with the that valve overfilling mm -hmm. and what happens is it would always seem to always be the idle compressor <laughs> say medium temp two or three would fill up with oil right yeah. it would take enough oil away that eventually medium temp one would trip then number medium temp two would come on and then that would eventually trip and then medium temp three would come on and when that one came on we would like to do what I like to call puke a lot of oil out of that sensor. When you come in there, that rack will be drenched in oil. 
there's a store somewhere up in Connecticut, and I don't remember which one it was. I think it might have been a Whole Foods that there's a wily e. coyote thing of Brett on the side of the wall where I got sprayed with oil, and you could see like the outline right on the freaking wall. And it was funny because I took a picture of it like, after I cleaned my face off of the oil, I took a picture of it, and someone figured it'd be funny to like basically draw something on the wall, and it looked really pretty. It's hilarious you said that. I was doing a, we were taking an old food line and changing it into a bottom dollar, which was a really cheap store. And we were downsizing the compressors because we were taking cases out of the store. Uh -huh. And me and my buddy got it out. And I said, don't you drop that compressor. And about the time I finished my words, he dropped that damn thing before we could cap it off. And when it hit, it sprayed me from my kneecaps to my head. And literally against the back wall that I was standing to was the only dry spot there. <laughs> it's hilarious. I says, all right, now you get to clean the mess up and finish this because I'm going home and changing and I'm not coming back. When I worked for Devault Refrigeration, when I was like fairly new, I, I <laughs> the guy asked me, he's like, did you bleed the compressor? I was like, yeah, I don't think there's any pressure in it. And he's using the Ugga Dugga on there and all of a sudden it just blew up. He's like, I thought you said, you told me never, you know, never believe anything anyone said. I thought you checked it. <laughs> yep. If you got a buddy and he tells you something's right, you can believe him, but I would still check it anyway. Especially when it comes to those lineman pliers. I'm tired of buying them because I keep getting holes in the damn blades. <laughs> as long as they're insulated. Go ahead. All right. I think later on we're going to see a better shot of our high pressure uh, switch and our relief valve. So basically what it is, if something happens, somebody closed, we, we did a valve service job on a separator and you get pressure back in there and somebody forgot to open the vents or out in the outlet mm -hmm. and turn it on. Or if you back, if you back seat them valves and close off the discharge pipe or what you were talking about earlier, you get enough liquid in there and you heat it up. All right. Oh yeah, here we go. So we have two systems. We have a 120 bar system. We have a 130 bar system. The switch on the 100 bar, 120 bars rated for 108, 120 bar system rated for 108 bar on the pressure switch trip. And I want to say the relief valve on the front there is five something bad. You're going to make me lie. 560 or something like that. Then on the 130 bar system, we have a 17, 117 bar 1697 pressure switch. So this came up in the class today. When we're doing a HFC rack, we'll usually close them discharge valves and test those pressure switches, right? Make sure they're calibrated. Are you, I mean, you going to do that, Brent? Mm -mm. Not me, buddy. I what I'm going to do is, is I'm going to unscrew that because if you decide you're going to pressure test that thing, I'm going to watch you, but I'm going to watch you from about 30 feet away. Agreed. <laughs> Agreed. 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 All right, so... I know you guys because I'm a technician just like you, and I see a Allen wrench on an adjustable switch on the front of that compressor. I want to find out what it's going to do, right? Don't mess with it. It's calibrated to relief at a certain pressure, right? But it's something to turn, Paul. It's something to turn. I have complained about that forever. Oh, little note, guys. We found out from Crewan. This is a photo optic sensor level. You've got that sight glass there on the front on that Creelon, right? Mm -hmm. It You'll see an oil level, but it's not the true level of the compressor. You go back a few inches and turn 90 degrees, and there's a brass plate with two holes in it mm -hmm. that allow the oil to go up and down. The true level is inside in that barrel right there close to the compressor. Mm -hmm. What they also recommend is you cover that sight glass. <laughs> Because if the doors open or if it's a white roof and it's shining up bright enough and lights yeah. up the inside of the cabinet, it can affect that 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 sensor. Get the hell out. Nope. So we were getting a lot of fills, and what it is is it goes in there and it still it doesn't see the wheel. It's actually seeing a lot of light, so it continues to fill. That's no it's good. Thinking, it's thinking it's foam or air. So I got a question about this because I know they're like the HB sensors and I know we're, we're not talking about HB sensors right now, but like I had saw something in their, in their documentation where they had to be at a certain angle. I think it was like a five, 5% angle. So my ask is because we're talking about stuff that's photoopic, right? Yep. That rack would technically have to be level 
right? Otherwise, that's going to affect how that is. So if you have a rack like slanted down on the right hand side, like towards the oil, but the compressors keep grenading because all the oil is basically wanting to sit near there, that's going to affect that, not? It is. It is. Now, let me step back into I know what the nomenclature says. Okay. In the manual, we mount those switches on a 90 degree plane from the compressor. Hmm. We don't have the tilt there. And we've never had any issues with that sensor operation operating. Okay. All right. Because it went back to we had some separator problems we'll discuss later where it would fire and stay fired. Once it got really hot out, it's a whole different thing. We'll talk yeah. about it later, maybe. Yeah. But we've had no issues with the oil draining out of those sensors because the, the, all the holes are offset. And how uh, we'll, uh, we'll get into it later, but it's basically it's a conductive sensor. And that conductive sensor is calibrated off of, and I'm going to say this several times, Bitzer 85K oil, ESE 85K. It's not calibrated off MCAR 85 oil. It's calibrated off Bitzer 85K. Okay. So if you start changing, putting different oils in there, you're going to start switch, changing the switching points on how those sensors react. I'll be honest with you. I'm dreading the day where we start not just using just BSEK 85. I know we've had a lot of European manufacturers come in the market and they're pushing that PAG like no tomorrow, which yeah. which works incredibly different than our good old faithful POE. So that's going to yeah. be interesting when that start, <laughs> starts happening. Yeah, we got everybody's coming into the market now because they see the U.S. as an open market. We got Arneg stores coming in. They're putting in their CO2 racks. Carnot out of Canada. Okay. Carrier just introduced their 90 bar system. Yeah. And they, have, and they have no oil separator on those systems. Yes. So <laughs> let's discuss the 90 bar system right now. Um, so right, I'm here. We go to a 90 bar system. We First of all, we have to have the evaporator coils that can handle it. I agree with that. What's that going to do to installation costs? When we go yeah. 90 bar. You're what's to make the it difference up. in the cost of a 10 foot stick of high pressure copper versus K and L? Oh, I don't concern myself with such things, but I'm assuming a lot. I want to get the numbers right. Double? Uh, no, we're not even close. It's way more. Oh, shit. Oh, okay. Way Never mind. more. So now your installation costs are going to go up because your piping costs went up. And I've heard all kinds of numbers. I don't deal with that either because I don't buy copper. But I've heard contractors say they're paying $700 for a stick of that stuff. Oh, my God. Just saying that's what I've heard. Yeah, I don't buy those things. I don't like. I, I don't, don't either. And then fittings. I don't buy the fittings either. But your installation costs are going to go up considerably. Yeah. Versus a heat exchanger and a condensing unit. I'll bet the heat exchanger condensing unit for uh, backup will pay for it all day. Yeah, because those the, I've seen ones like on some of the other racks. It's like a little fractional horse, little like fifth horsepower compressor. That those small compressors that they able to to act as a refrigerant conservatory. If installed right, if it is, has actual high pressure switch, if it is actually on a generator, right? And if it's not used all year round as a, hey, the rack isn't working right, so I, I need to just turn this thing on. Yeah, I can tell you we're testing a Toshiba, little Toshiba compressor. It's about six, eight inches tall that will, can actually run off a UPS system. Not bad. Viability, I can't, I don't know yet. I haven't seen it in operation. We're in testing. Guys, I'm going to tell you right now. <clears throat> as a factory rep, I have to say what we do at the factory. Some of my opinions I give you are my personal opinions. So don't come back and say that Paul says this is how you do this. Some things are my personal opinions. Of all the racks I started, this is what I do. You know what I mean? We have a startup seat. Hell, I wrote and unassisted startup sheets. So in other words, if I'm not on site, a contractor with minimum knowledge will go step through, step by step through the E2, how to check it, how to program it, how to associate, and how to test and start the rack without one of our technicians on site. 
There's a lot of literature out there, but that's, I wrote it the way I start a rack up. They had a way it's when you get our racks, there's a QR code on the front. That QR code will now give you a, take you to our startup manual, which has everything from front to back. Tells you how to do it. Tells you all the pressures. Eventually what we want to do with that QR code is come up with where we have videos on how to, how to, sorry, how to change the filter, how to how to calibrate the high pressure valve, how to basically diagnose the system. Eventually, we're going to go to that. Wow. Yep. It'll have warranty sheets. It'll have part, Hill Phoenix part numbers for ordering parts like pressure switches, filters, the consumable parts that you use every year. But that's where we're trying to make it better for the technicians out there. I'm a firm believer in making it better. I've been doing this for 40 years. I've been out there in the field with no assistance. So when guys call me, if it's a reasonable time before midnight, I'll usually pick up the phone and talk to you guys because I know you're out there and you need help. But don't call me up and go, my rack is off. What do I do? Or, hey, I haven't gotten there yet. I'm on the way there. I'll be there in about an hour. I just want to make sure I can get a hold of you right now. And can you go over every single issue that might be causing that? <laughs> then call me back because I'll tell you what, I'm probably not going to answer. <laughs> I'm out here to help you guys. I'm out here to support the customers. I guess I, I don't. I'm not. It's not a requirement, but mm -hmm. I just, it's in my nature. I totally agree with you. Like, I... What I did was when I took over the training department here, I basically made a database of yeah, there's 240 gigs of information that I have. And I put it all up on a website for all the employees. And basically anyone has access to it. Anyone, it's all searchable. And they're like, why did you, why did you do this? I said, because I'm lazy and I want to give you the information so you don't have to call me and say, hey, Brett, do you have this information? Because if you have access to it, I'm like, did you search it yet? Nope. All right, go search it. Let me know if you can't find it. You know what I mean? I'm not trying to blow you off, but that's the whole purpose of doing that. Trying to, I don't want to covet the information. People are like, why, why you, you really like doing this stuff? I was like, yeah, but I want to share the information. They're like, why aren't you afraid of someone being smarter? Hell, I want people to be smarter. I don't care. I want them to do stuff. I'm lazy. I'd rather have them do it than me. 100% agree on that. I want to, <laughs> when I do a startup, if there's not issues and we have time, I will usually have classes for the guys. 100%. I think it's a waste of time for me to teach the install guys how the system works and how to troubleshoot it because they're not the guys that are going to get called up at 2 o'clock in the morning to come out and look at the rack. Yeah, for sure. I mean, we live in a wonderful age. we got a library right here. A library. When I was riding around, we had a calling card and a beeper, and you had I had the whole roll of quarters. foot <laughs> wide Copeland manual, the four inch spoiler manual and everything else you needed to page through and find your answers for what you needed. Maybe that's what made me the guy I am today. I will look and try to solve the problem before I'll call somebody up to use the easy button. Or as they like to say there on that TV show, let's call a friend. Yeah. Phone a friend. <laughs> go ahead, man. Sorry to sidetrack you. No, you're good. All right. So let's go move on here. All right, so this is our Creron oil sensor, and this is our 140 bar relief valve. Anybody know what that is? The press? I apologize, guys. I speak in bar because that's how I was taught when I walked into the factory the first day. I used my handy-dandy Bitzer sliding ruler. 2030. Yep, 2030. So that relief valve there that's listed 2030. And our trip on our other valve was what, 17-something, 1740? Like 1743, so typically, yeah. Yep. Yep. So we're going to pop that. And if you notice, there's two sensor points there on the top of that valve, right? There's the one, the neutral point that our pressure switch is on that can never be closed. And then you have your, your test port for when you front seat, you can isolate it and put your gauges on it, whatever you want to do. And the nice thing about our racks is you don't need to walk up to the roof with a set of gauges because you can see everything in the E2. We have what I like to call analog gauges on those things that are pretty accurate on all the important points. The only thing I do have that I carry with me on a plane is I have a Dewar's 
hydraulic gauge that goes up to 3,000, one goes up to 5,000. And I went out and had to a hydraulic store, got quick disconnects, hydraulic disconnects, so I can mm -hmm. separate them and pack them. And mm -hmm. got a 10 foot and a six foot and a 10 foot steel braided hose to connect. And I use them when I start up and when I'm verifying my transducers that they're oper they're reading correctly and reading the same thing that's in your on your control system. Yeah, and the nice thing about it is like on the HPV side, like on the side that you're on the you know high side on where the gas cooler is, you have two typical transducers, right? Whatever's controlling your HPV valve, but also yeah. typically for the energy management system itself. Plus yeah. you have the analog cage right there. So if the two pressure transducers are not reading, high probability something is probably wrong because they're right next to each other. Yes. So... If you have an iPro and an Emerson control system, you got two transducers on that drop leg. One controls the high pressure valve. The other controls the EMS system for the fan control, and the PTR, and your trip points. So if you lose your discharge transducer or you lose your high pressure, you can't just eliminate one because the other one's going to be some sort of safety control. So you're going to have to, I always tell everybody, carry a 2,000, a 1,000, and a 650. And that'll cover you for your transducers on a rack. Yeah, because you can't use your testos on the transcritical side. If I'm, not, if I'm not mistaken, they're only good. I think they have a, a working pressure of 850. You can't really go, I, I, and maybe I'm wrong, but I do know that you can't have those on the TC side. And I'm calling, I'm sorry, and I'm breaking one of your cardinal rules, calling it the TC side, but you know, the side that can hit the critical point. No, that's, that's that. cool. But what I'm saying is that you can't just, hey, I got to calibrate the pressure transducers. Hell, if it's a 60 degree day, and you're running a five degree, if you're running as, as long as you're not putting that pressure transducer that you have for like your test kit above the pressure where you have two other readings that if you think one is off, as long as you have it off, or if the rack is off and the fans are just rolling, there's another reason that you could potentially have it on there. But most of the time I do agree with you, you should have your, your hydraulic hoses on there. Yep. And at, at Pittsburgh last week, we had JB and Yellow Jacket out there. And they both had their version of the Bluetooth gauges or transducer uh, readers. Mm -hmm. And Testo is correct. Testo goes to 850. I don't know if they've changed that on any of the new versions. The JB and the uh, Yellow Jacket, I now go to 800 because I had the guy look. I was asking. Because so guy used me. one of those manufacturers I was talking to and it said, good for co2 and i'm like really i'm like how high and they're like oh it does all of it i was like are you sure about that he's i was like you might want to call your engineer so they called the engineer back he's like, yeah it's only good for subcritical co2 i was subcritical. like because, you, because your gauge set goes as good for what he's like, the engineer said it's good for about a thousand psi i said yes so you better change that in the literature so you don't get in trouble <laughs> yeah exactly all right, on the low temp side, we have the two, we have a digital discus, uh, excuse me, a digital scroll and a standard scroll. On our new racks, they were pretty fairly sized together on the old racks. On our new racks, we got a, we have the big one. I want, I don't, can't remember the uh, horsepower on that. And then the smaller one, which is I think a third the capacity of the larger one. Then we have our mechanical switches, high pressure, low pressure which are basically just there for, if we have a failure, the EMS system. They're just backups. One, so set, I, one set at one. I see the tube on the left-hand side on the bigger compressor. So that, that larger one is the digital compressor then. Is that, that's, that's correct, correct. one on the left. Okay. You can see the vent line up on top of it. Over that's, top of the <laughs> that's where I was making my assumption off of. <laughs> yep. So we modulate that digital down to 10%. A lot of engineers say we really don't want to modulate at 10 percent for very long so we really like 30 percent. but you deal with what you have to deal with on your rack the problem with co2 if you start a rack and it's 95 degrees in that store those cases will be at temp in 20 minutes you don't get any runtime to diagnose them so you're always it's pull down and then just idles and up and down with whatever you're temperature variations are in your cases. Agreed? Yeah, I agree. I started a store that the whole sidewall was missing. My cases were pulling temp 
but I had to pull the damn curtains on them because we were doing so much latent heat in the, or latent work in the cases. We were condensing moisture. It was running out the cases. But as, as long as you were staggering them, because oh. I, had, I was just about to say, you can't just say, I'm going to turn them on, rip, let it rip. You know what I mean? No. Because, because no. I, I had a problem where a store was down for a day or so. We were waiting on a pump and we got a pump in and i started up and i was like oh i'll just let the timing circuit go nope because the case is got up to 60 degrees and basically i had to wait until the big box got down to about 30 like 31 degrees so right below where the bt load went down once it went past freezing then i started the next one then i started the next one because this was all freezers that i was starting up yeah that's a lot of load so we had an issue back in 2017 one of the contractors calls me up goes hey I keep going out on lock rotor on the ICDM on the on the I, the ICDM controller. Did you I broke say that right? IDCM. I, I think I think I was trying to figure that out. So I think it's intelligent digital compressor management modulation. Right? Modulation. modulation. I was yes. close. Two out three to four. So what was happening was in an Audi's we have we had back then it was two 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 freezers and two coils in the freezer. Mm -hmm. So they would go into defrost. When we come out, we limit the valve to 15% for two and a half minutes. Because what we want to do is we want to cool that coil down before we start letting them rip. But what was happening was mm -hmm. there's a time delay in the E2 that's built in there before it allows the second pressure to come on. So yeah. those would come out, do their 15%, then shoot on up to 70 80%. Our suction on our low temp would reach 300, 320. It wow. was pushing the amps up high enough through that controller that it was tripping in on overcurrent, on lock rotor. I'm sorry, lock rotor, which was 160 amps. And in a couple of cases, when that one tripped out, the second one, we tripped the breaker. We pulled so many amps. So what I did was is I went in, I staggered them. I made one coil two and a half minutes. The second coil, I made four and a half minutes. So I talked to someone about this literally la like last week in class and he had said that and he said he was still having issues. Well, and I, I just want you to think about this for a second. So the pulse width valves, like 15% is basically zero, zero pulsing, right? So if you do it to at least 20, per, like 20% to get a little bit more of a frosty, frosty pattern on there, it, it might help it a little bit. Cause we were all talking through it as a class. We just made it a group discussion. Do you know what I'm saying? What was the span delay on that? That was I don't know. Was he bringing the span on prematurely? I, that question did not, no. I, he said just, he's because he said at first he was pulsing the, the pulse with valve at 15%, but I'm pretty sure 15% is zero pulses, right? Where just like 85% 85, 85 is basically 100%. About a half second of pulse almost, a little more yeah. than half a second. We've not had any issues with that combination anywhere. Okay. Uh, only places I've, only time I've seen that is again where somebody is full with or the termination isn't working properly for the fan delay. Mm -hmm. and the fans come on too early. Ooh, yeah, that could be an issue too. Yes. Very much. Now on a bigger rack, that's not a problem. You got more compressor. But on these smaller racks with these little uh, scroll compressors, you're sizing the compressors for the load, and sometimes the load is too much. Gotcha. And anyway, that's how we overcame that. Now, today with the three evaporators, we do four, two and a half, four and a half, six and a half. It's, and I've never had any issues. I've never seen the suction go over 280 pounds. Could you also use the MOP as like almost like a crankcase pressure regulator, right? Again, like that's what I said before. We set that up on the low temps at 312. But like I said before, if you're pumping along and say you lose the, the number two or the number one, number two is trying to hold the load, it's not capable on a 95 degree day mm -hmm. and a lot of customers shopping the case or the walk okay. through the reaching doors. Yeah. So what's going to happen is, is you're going to hit the 312, the, the valve will shut off, the compressor pulls the suction down, then the valve comes back on and it's back and forth. But you're going to have an alarm that you've lost one of those compressors. Yeah, no, I don't understand that, but I'm saying if you have multiple coils, could you basically yep. stagger them? I know you said three, 312 is what your setting is, but could you yep. do one at 312, and then once the suction goes down to a little bit lower than that, then you kick that one on, then it goes a little bit lower, then kick that one on, and then, you know, basically just kind of load shedding it on, if you will. Yes. 
So if I don't, I'm going to say this wrong, and I probably am wrong, but I thought when that valve came out, went, came out of that safety mode, mm -hmm. it went through the timer, the two and a half minutes, four and a half, six and a half. I have to look at that now. I just asked myself that question. See, I don't know everything, guys. I don't. Uh, but listen, I, I, I can work it out logically, or I know where to get the answer. And that's usually what it is, right? But the mechanics that are analytical, they can think through thoughts like, okay, what's going to happen if we were to do this? What if it's going to be too much load? It's going to overamp and basically systematically go through. And that's why people like you, they can systematically step through and make assumptions based off of what it's doing, based off of just logic, right? See, and, and I've been told this numerous times by many people. That when I'm talking to people, I speak above them. And what I mean by above them is I, I have a an assumption that people have a certain understanding of how things work. So sometimes I speak too fast. I've been told that in evaluations. I even had Rusty tell me that. He goes, sometimes, yeah, you need to bring that down a little. So I try to make sure I do. I step that back. See, I speak too fast, but my problem is like, if you ask me a question, I have to make sure you understand what I'm going to be talking about here in a minute. So like, I'll bring basic theory into it, but I was like, I'm getting there. I'm getting to your question. Cause I have to make sure you understand that. So you understand the answer because as an educator, right? If you just give them the answer, they're just going to remember that answer. But if they listen yeah, to my five or seven minute spiel about why that's that way, they're more likely to actually remember why the answer is what it is. I don't want people just knowing the answer. I want to know, I want them to know why, because I think technicians learn better when they understand the why, not just be like, hey, one time in 85, I had this thing happen and it was the pressure switch. Why? There's a reason why that happened, right? I agree with you wholeheartedly. I think it makes us better instructor instructors when we help the technician learn why and how to figure out what's going on. Understood. Yes, agreed with you, 100%. Just oh, lost my stick here. <laughs> All right, Crewon oil level sensor, low temp control. So there are two versions of this sensor. There's the 120, 130 bar, actually, I think about that. I'll have to go back and look. I think they're rated for 130 bar because on our mini rec racks, our mini flex racks, 240 to 375 BT, 100,000 BTU, we use a centrifugal separator combination reservoir. So we use a high pressure oil system. So our oil is feeding at whatever our discharge pressure is. And right now the Crewan is the one we utilize to do that. They're rated for it. I'm not going to lie. That scares me because I know what 30 pounds of oil pressure looks like in a mechanical room. I can only envision <laughs> yes. what yes. 1,500 pounds of oil leakage happens. Yep. But on our standard racks, there's two versions. And on our low temp side, you could use the standard version oil switch, which is probably cheaper than the 120, 130 bar rated switch. All right. See if we can move on. We're way into a... All right, so high pressure switches, we talked about this early. This happens to be one of our older racks because you see it has, they have OMB controls on them. High pressure set for 600, low pressure set for 100. These are only backup switches because our pump down and cutout pressures are built into our controller. This is our 45 bar discharge relief valve from the compressor low temp discharge into our medium temp suction. That pressure is 652. It's also the same on the medium temp suction because that's where we're discharging. We need to have the relief point here also. Our high pressure alarm for our low temp that we utilize is 575. And we'll cut those compressors off because now we have to look at there's something wrong with our medium temp suction group and we can't control the suction if we're getting that high. So we want to take this out of the equation. We'll bring it back in when it resets, but we're going to take it out so that we're not continually feeding our medium temp suction group and continuing to overpower our group. Back in when I first started here, the low temp and medium temp were bound together. So if the low medium temp was running, the low temp was allowed to run. But if the medium temp was not running, the low temp could not run. 
there was a lot of discussions on now where we might pop relief valve. But after everybody's really sitting down determining, if we got a rack that's in fail and we're trying to get pressure built up on the medium temp suction, let's let the low temp run and help us get that medium temp suction up and running and get our compressors running. So that's how we do it today. They're untethered unless it's a Danfoss control. That's a binding that's internal of the of the controls that we can't uh, manipulate. In the actual pack controller, yeah. Yep, in the 782, 781 pack controller. Yep. Something they're probably looking at, at changing or making it an option going forward in the future. Mm -hmm. But for right now, that's just how it is. You can delay and let it run in a delay after the media temp su suction shuts off and allow that low temp to run a little longer. There, That option is there. All right. This is our receiver vessel built by Bitzer. Look down at the bottom right corner of that drawing. If you look on the first one to the left, you'll see our dip tube where we pick up our liquid. That very center sight glass is our sight glass. That's our operating level, right? Mm -hmm. And then in the middle up there towards the top, you'll see our low temp heat exchanger. AAS the engineers is roughly uh, the equivalent of 95 pipe looped around in there. We're basically making sure that our return gas coming back from the from this low temp suction is droplet free going into our low temp compressors. So we will pick up a little bit of superheat in there also. And that's because basically the temperature of there, let's just say you said it was 35 degrees. 35 degrees. There. So if yep. your low temp suction is running at minus 22, that's 55 degrees of superheat. And the bad thing is once we pull down and everything is at temp, we're going to have a high superheat anyway because we sacrifice superheat control for temperature control when our controllers get to that point, correct? Yeah. We don't care about superheat when we're at temp. Yeah, because the valves aren't going to feed. We just got to make sure we, we still have a good superheat on the low temp compressors, bitsers. And I, I don't, I, I think for the, yeah, actually for the Copeland subcritical compressors, they also want 36 degrees minimum of superheat. So you're well above that at that point if that's what you're doing. Yes. Yeah, and, and, and that's, it, the, the scroll has turned out to be a really hardy compressor. And it has exceeded some of their actual parameters. It'll run with liquid. It'll run warmer. But it's just a, it's a byproduct of this smaller format stores. You know what I mean? No, understood. It's just oil return on the, it's not so much about oil return, it's oil viscosity. So yes. if you talk to Andre Pottenode, brilliant cat and he showed me a white paper where you can see what happens to the viscosity and the reason why the tran the transcritical or high site compressors can run at a 20 degree superheat is because a you have a higher compression ratio and that but you're only bringing back 18 degrees saturated rather today's episode is sponsored by the ref rush shield rdp series differential pressure monitors from westermeyer industries now available for transcritical co2 systems in addition to other common pressures and refrigerants when the filter element of your coalescing oil separator is contaminated, it can hurt your system's performance and efficiency. But how do you know when it's time to replace that filter? Wait too long to replace, and you could end up with a nasty filter blowout. But replacing too often can be a waste of time and money. The answer is installing a differential pressure monitor. The RDP series differential pressure monitors, including the new transcritical CO2 model, are available now from Westermeyer Industries. To find out more information, email sales at westermeyer.com. That's W-E-S-T-E-R-M-E-Y-E-R-I-N-D-COM. Than minus 20, so the oil is a little bit warmer on that belly. And, and these oils also have a lower limit temperature. And I, I, I'm not going to say, I think it's in somewhere in the 50 some degree range where mm -hmm. we don't want that oil to get colder than that when it's sitting in our reservoir. That's why you have the crankcase heaters on a couple hours, or what, 24 hours is what you said in your startup, right? You're yep. supposed to have 24 hours before you actually roll that rack on. That's correct. All right. Now, if you look at the top, we have two siphon tubes that come off the top. One of them siphon tubes is used for our gas cooler bypass. We come off of there, we want to reach as high up as possible. So in case we ever got too full of the liquid and, and it's happened, I've had a contractor put uh, six bottles in a receiver because he didn't see anything in the sight glass because it was really clear. <laughs> I'll, I'll give you another one here in a minute. It happened twice to us. And then the second one is going to be for our feeder for our manifold that our, all our transducer, our gauge and all that are off of. 
And the relief, yeah. Yeah. Yes. Very good. All right. Let's see. So we're using these HB conductive probes. These are conductive. In other words, they are calibrated for this one being the, the flash tank. Re flash receiver is calibrated for the conductivity of CO, which is way lower than the conductivity of oil. So this sensor is only good in the vessel. And if you ever pulled that probe out, that probe is close to 12 inches long. It needs more surface area for contact and to switch that switch. So if you were testing that switch, you had it in your hand, the power head's powered up. If you were to put it in a, if you had the capability to have liquid CO2 in a bucket, when you were ticking it in there, that thing should fire at the 50% mark. So when we're laying vertically on our side, horizontally on our side, half of that sensor gets liquid on it, it'll fire that switch. It's enough conductivity to fire that calibrated switch. All right. Yep. The, lights. the old days you had a black, the, the, the sensor would be black when there was nothing present. The problem was you didn't know if you even had power or if it was working. You would have to physically check it. So all of a sudden in 2020, they come out with a new switch. We're putting on the racks. I get a call. What's the flashing green light? And I said, that means go. I don't know. I don't go have any flashing green go light. Go get a new sensor is what it yeah. means. So I had to pull up the new manual and look at it because that's what I would do. And lo and behold, they have a heartbeat. It tells you there's power on that switch. So a flashing green light means you have a heartbeat. And you don't have any fluid uh, present. So in the reservoir and the receiver, that's a bad thing. That means we don't have oil. We don't have CO2. In the separator, that's a good thing. That just means we're still empty until we fill it up, pulse the switch, yeah. transfer the oil. This switch head is not compatible, cannot be transferred over to the oil sensor if you lose it. That's something we'll go in later. All right. Flashing green, heartbeat, solid red, fluid present. Flashing red means you have an electromechanical disconnect. Now, in other words, when you pull that power head off of the well, the little, it's like a pyramid goes into the center probe, which is your positive probe down to isolated probe down the center of that is there's a disconnect and it's not they're not reading anymore. If you pull it apart, usually it'll be rust or some of that paste is will get watery and get a messy mix. Clean it off, put it back together, and nine times out of ten, it still works. We charge our vessels, and this is how our factory and our training program teaches. We charge our vessels through the bottom charge station on the vessel itself. That's how we charge our racks. If you lose gas, you can charge through there while the rack's still running. You can take the vessel down to whatever the, take the bottle down to whatever the vessel pressure is. If you got a gauge on your charging line and it hits 515, you're not going to transfer any more liquid. So I understand like you're supposed to, you, you maintain the differential of between your medium temp suction and your flash tank in order to achieve oil differential. Yep. Is there anything you're opting against? Let's just say I got to get that. I want to try to get as much CO2 out of that cylinder as humanly possible. Are, are, are you going to yell at me if I lower the suction, pre suction pressure and flash tank pressure temporarily just to get more CO2 out of that tank? Not at all. I will give you a pass if you can find a suction line on the low temp that's not connected to a transducer somewhere downstairs. I've We've had stores where they only had so many bottles. We had to use every pound we could get out of a bottle because when you're charging the vessel pressure, you're going to leave 12 to 15 pounds in that bottle. What is what we've always measured. Okay. Wait, so, wait, yeah, wait. How, how much, how much? 12 to 15 pounds. Every time I've had a guy that weighed his charges in, they usually leave about 12 pounds in there. Get the hell out. Seriously. Yes, sir. I didn't, oh my God. That's a lot. That's a lot. That's so, fifteen dollars worth of gas. Yeah, and so so whenever I when I when I ordered my gas for my trainer, I said I was like, I need one vapor bottle and the rest liquid. And they're like, Don't you need more vapor? I said, No, I'm going to be making my own vapor cylinders as the time goes on. Yes, we are. Yes, <laughs> we are. <laughs> hey, look, in the field, 
when all we had was liquid b- bottles, we've done the old 180 and put them things on the upside down and don't ever, nobody, I'll, I'll deny anything <laughs> just to get vapor out of them. I, I'm just going to do that. What's that? I said, I'm just going to do this. Hear no evil, see no evil. I'm just doing this. Yep, that's exactly right. Hey, guys, when you're out there and you're in trouble, you do what you need to do to get your rack up and running. I had a contractor call me because every time they pump down the rack for service and and pump down the liquid in the suction lines, right? Yeah. He goes, it's got to be a cheaper way to fill these lines up, pressurize them before we put liquid back in here because – we, I say, and, and Hill Phoenix says, I'm sorry, guys. That's all right. I, we, Hill Phoenix say, bring up your lines to 150 pounds before you introduce liquid. Yeah, that's well above the 61 PSI triple point, but we use 150 PSI as our reference. Then that makes everything steady. I love 150 PSI because when I walk up to that rack and I'm going through all the case controllers, I'm looking at the transducer. And if everything's pressurized at 150, my should be reading 150 plus or minus a few percentage, right? I'm checking at the same time all the, the calibration on all my valves. And I'll make notes on ones that are lower or higher. Then we'll go check them later on. That's that bes- besides the 150. I, like I follow that to the letter. We I like I was like, you already got tons of pounds of pressure in your cylinder and your reliefs, where your reliefs are setting for, you're putting vapor, and I'm like. Throw them up to 300 pounds because then a lot of the ones that are midway where they're 650, you're going to, you should be almost in, exactly in the middle. But it's, we're doing the same thing, different candy bar. That's really it. This is how you start a rack up. This is how I start right. Unfortunately, I don't have the liberty of. I understand. Yes. So back to the customer, he goes, I keep having to use that vapor bottles and, and, and it's getting harder and harder to find them. I said, me personally, I'd use the big black vapor bottle up in the rack and just come off of the header and pressurize my liquid line and my suction lines. Put a gauge on your header on the side of your vessel and use that vapor to pressurize your lines. Why waste Why waste a bottle? Use what you already have. 100%. I'm with you. All right, very good. Going forward. High pressure control valves. All right, so... High pressure control valve. If it's a 326A, let's see where we're going with this. If it's a 326A, you have three PIDs to operate that valve built into that controller. There's your subcritical PID for work for operating the valve in subcritical mode, right? Mm-hmm. Bitzer, if I remember the conversation right, has a third PID that transitions from crit, some, some crit, subcritical to transcritical, makes mm-hmm. it a smooth, smooth transition rather than you get a bleep and a blip. And then it goes back to normal operations once we transition into the PID to operate when we're transcritical. Because mm-hmm. one won't do the other. Emerson has two PIDs. They have a subcritical and transcritical. And I might be wrong, but I'm pretty sure that's how I read it and how it's been explained to me. So when you're transitioning, you might get a blip where the pressure will go off a little, a little off kilter, but come right back because you're in a slow transition mode. I think they smooth, they smoothed out where they, they used to, something used to happen with the algorithm. So now they've actually made the smoother transition to that point. So I think they might be doing that. I might they be are. Concern. All right, very good. Let's get back into this. All right, so this is one of our Flex 2L racks. This is the three-dimensional design. You'll see our high-pressure valve where you see the Belimo on the very right. That's our heat reclaim valve. And this is our inlet. Oh, I apologize. That's our gas cooler bypass. All right, so we're going to go up and in to our CCMT valve. And you can tell a CCMT valve from a CCM valve because you have an offset inlet. Mm -hmm. You come in on the high side, go out on the low side like a TXD, right? Because it's easier to plug the dam than to try to keep the dam from pushing down into your hole, right? Yep. All right, very good. So basically the ICMT valve and the CCM valves are basically just, they're TXDs. They're in the industrial world, 
that's a TXD valve. So it works the same principle. It's just a pressure differential valve. So when we're transcritical, we're coming in with a high temp vapor going through that valve. The pre-programmed set points in the controller when you're transcritical are going to keep you on the wet side of the dome. So that we're, produce, we're producing more liquid than we are vapor. And when we pr start producing more vapor, we come, become really inefficient because now we're spending all of our compressor energy to get rid of the vapor. So what we try to do is get close to the 80% flash point in there where we're 80% of our vapors go on the liquid and 20% is venting into the vessel and be having to be consumed by our compressors. We're in, sub we're in subcritical operation. That's transcritical. Subcritical, God dang it. Subcritical, we're just, all that valve does is control our subcooling. But when we're transcritical, we have to make sure we stay on a predetermined path to keep us wet instead of more vapor. Understood. Because normally when we're subcritical, our valves yeah, open from zero to normally runs 20 to 40% is my experience. But once we go, God dang it, I keep touching that. Once we go transcritical, that's different. Hope I didn't lose my train of thought there. <laughs> All right, let's go on because we're running out of time. So these are the two types of uh, CCMT valves. The one on the left, this offers the option of a transducer mounted mm -hmm. up down the outlet. And oh, I apologize, that's the inlet. And then the other one doesn't have that option. So this is a, a smaller valve. Usually our CCMT 16s will have that. And that's what we're using for a high pressure valve on our Flex 2O racks. And if it doesn't, smaller booster racks. And you guys started putting screens before them because the smaller valves do not actually have an internal screen, correct? We also have a, a Y strainer on our ICAD valves also. Okay. Because in all the racks I started and helped guys troubleshoot, I've only had two racks where we got debris from the condenser into that valve and actually clogged up that Y strainer. Gotcha. And we'll point that out later. We also have one coming off of our receiver after our king valve. So if it does clog up, that's usually from welding slag when they weld the vessels and they, they don't get it completely cleaned out. And it usually happens really fast in the beginning of startup, anywhere from an hour and a half to when you come back the next day, all of a sudden all your cases are not making temp. Then I would look at volume or, or liquid quantity, quality. If it's two or three cases, then I'd look at I'd look at case controllers. But other than that, I'd go right up to do we have enough vapor pressure or do we have enough liquid or we do have a really extreme pressure drop across that valve, that Y strainer. Flash cast bypass valve. Its duty or its only duty is to dump excess vapor pressure from the vessel. So if our reference is 515. Anything above 515, that valve is going to modulate to control it and dump it. It's not going to go open 100% because that would be foolish that we would rapidly drop the pressure of the vessel. We're going to modulate to and step it up in, in steps to maintain that pressure. Once it closes, that means we're at reference or below. If our vessel pressure drops and we can't control it, it gets down below. The magic number is... God, I'm going to lie here. 475, I think, on the iPro. It's whatever you're programming for, right? You just want to, you want to keep your different, you know, essentially it's what you're trying to do is maybe keep your differential between your compressors and your oil system if your oil separator happens to be the vent off the flash tank, right? And that is with us. Our reservoir vents to the flash tank. So whatever our reservoir is, is what our receiver, our oil reservoir is going to be. So if it's at 515, our receiver's at 515, our medium temp suction, we modulated at 400. You can go a little higher. I would not go above 410, 420 because you're really closing in on what your differential is. I like to see, the factory says 80, I like to see 100 pounds differential because our vessel is not a fixed point. It's gonna modulate and our suction is gonna modulate. Sometimes they'll get close. 
especially in low ambient conditions with a high suction load, something just come out of defrost. What I would like to see is they start floating the racks, floating the suction on the medium temp, but also with that, because you would have to is float the float, the oil or the flash tank off of that in order to still do that. But the other caveat to that is you could have a, a pressure regulator basically on your suction doing the oil differential on there, just like our old school conventional chemical refrigerant racks. Yep. Everything's possible, but everything comes at a cost to the customer. Understood. Yep. And we have to be in line. If we build a nice, beautiful rack that everybody loves, probably won't sell a lot of them. I got it's you. An extremely competitive market out there. Fair enough. Yep. 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 Hey, Paul, I don't know about you, brother, but I am getting spent. My brain is busted and I'm just, I'm smoked here at this point. So I'd say let's, let's continue this conversation, man. Cause like I, I'm digging it. It's just, man, I'm tired. It's seven o'clock here or oh, no, Shit. it's eight o'clock. And so that means for me, it's basically 10 o'clock. I've been up since about. 4 30 this morning so i'm about broken but please don't take this as an insult man i just i want to keep talking but done i'm done i agree, I agree Brett. Done. i've been up since i said 3 30 this morning myself that freaking time change let me tell you it's that whole freaking going from the east coast and freaking oh i don't know what it is man cali hotel whatever you want to call it dude but listen what you and i are going to catch up again and we're going to continue this conversation but paul i really appreciate you coming on and we'll have you on again to continue the rest of the stuff from the BGV out. How about that? I agree, man. I, I, this thing probably went out way longer than I thought it was going to go. But my problem is just like yours is I get talking about it and I, I just love it. You can't stop. Yep. I, want, I want to know more. I want to know more. But so. everything we're discussing is basically how we run a Hill Phoenix rack. How are, how my, unfortunately, I don't have the opportunity to look at my competitors. I don't know how they're running it. You guys have more insight to how they do it than I do. I love the fact that cats can call me from wherever and just tell me, okay, I'm like, I need help fixing. I'm like, how is it running? I was like, send me the PNID diagram, send me the program, send it over. We're going to figure this out. But hey, hey, Paul, till next time, and we'll talk to you soon. Thanks, guys. Thank Thanks you, for listening.